Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an oceanographer, explorer at National Geographic, founder of Mission Blue, and I'm an ocean elder. Thank you, ocean elders, for sponsoring this little soiree. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. And May the fourth be with you. Oh, <laughs> spend out time outdoors. You must. <laughs> well, tomorrow Cinco de Mayo. How about that? All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you can have some limes and salt then. Um, yeah. So you can uh, ask questions as we get through the program today by putting them in the Q and A box, and at the end of the uh, or towards the end of the episode, we will get through as many as we possibly can. I'm going to share our screen. Amazing. Yes. Uh oh, there we go. <laughs> Great. So, and before we get underway, let's remind everyone that the world is blue. blue. Never <laughs> forget it. <laughs> Thank you, world, for being blue. Today, we're very excited to have Dr. Megan Davis with us. She's an internationally recognized for her work in warm water aquaculture. And for the mm -hmm. past 27 years, she has been conducting research at Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Queen Conk Lab. Welcome, Megan. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia Earle. It's so wonderful to be here with you both. Here she is. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your research has taken you kind of all around Florida, all around the Caribbean, um, really Bahamas. studying the Bahamas, studying the, Belize, the, yeah. the Queen Conk. Um, you know, most people think of these guys like this. Like, hmm, delicious without really knowing, <laughs> well, really knowing who they are. But there's so much more to the conch. Mm. Charismatic critters for sure. And they are curious. Look at that face. <laughs> and everyone is just a little bit different from every other one. And Megan, one of the things I particularly love about each and every conch is that when they're out there cruising around in a seagrass meadow or in the open sand, they collect creatures on their back. Each one is like a little island. Uh, it's so true. It's all kinds of different algae and sponges, a lot of critters living on top of those uh, shells. And they're, they're no two exactly alike, either as individual conchs or as little islands of activity. Uh, and Liz, you've seen them like this. Oh, uh, yeah. Out grazing like big cows <laughs> from munching on the seagrass. <clears throat> but from the top, they look kind of nondescript, but turn them over. Yeah. And they're so beautiful. This is the one that I've had for like, I don't know, decades. Lives, lives on my desk. <laughs> but it's just such a beautiful shell. It, and even it's top long. Yeah, this one's off. been turned into a horn. So, <laughs> but. But they're just such amazing structures, and even what, even in this state, um, I sometimes I feel guilty for having it on my desk that I should really go put it back someplace so that an octopus or a hermit crab can make use of it instead of just me, you know, kind of loving it. <laughs> nice sculptures, though. But I think um, we added a couple of little images here just to show. How they can uh, yeah. decorate themselves. Like, where is the conch shell? <laughs> That's such a beautiful one. It's covered in, I always call that like the shag carpet, you know, it's, the, <laughs> it's so much like that. But it's the batopra, which is so <laughs> common in their sea rouse beds. Um, but I love when I love when I see that too. Yeah. Oh, there's the, another one. Yeah. The, he's trying to hide, but the horns show. <laughs> You're showing so, your horns, really? No. Yeah, it's a giveaway. <laughs> I'm not really here. Oh, yes, you yeah. are. <laughs> exactly. So how many kinds of conch are there out there? Is it just, I know you're working with the queen conch, but are there other varieties yeah. as well? Yeah, there are other varieties. There's about seven up to all total, and the queen conch is the largest of all of them. And, and the pinkest. And the pinkest, yes, um, quite the queen. And then there's the milk conch, 
um, which is very white inside. And there's two kinds of fighting conch. There's, yeah, there's yeah, great conch. Yeah, the, you can see the milk conch is the one on the, the bigger of the three down the bottom. And then in the middle is a Florida fighting conch. And there's also a West Indian fighting conch that's more orange in color. And then at the end there is a hawkwing conch. But there's also a beautiful rooster tail. And then closer down towards Brazil, there's the, the very giant Goliath um, strombid as yeah. well. They're just, just incredible to think, you know, they can go from a, a tiny floating the larvae to, you know, something with this sort of mass to it. How long does it take? I guess you'll explain that as we go along. But to get from a little larva to be a big grown-up conch. <laughs> yeah. oh. It takes it takes a good three to four years for it to get to that um, lip stage, and uh, then it just gets thicker and thicker after that. The lip. Yeah. Does anybody know how long they can live if they're not munched on by somebody? Yeah, it, it's pretty much um, known that they live somewhere between thirty and forty years, and wow. by the time they get that old, their shell is very thick, and because of all the um, seaweeds and sponges and things that have grown on top of it, it's, it's really quite, um, uh, you know, really blends in with the environment, I suppose is the way I always say it. It must it's because it likes heavier and heavier as they go along, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a heavy home because even when they're at this stage, they're, they're weighing like, like five pounds, you know, it's really incredible. That's a lot of carbon. Yeah, a lot. So their role is carbon capturing devices in over the, at least before humans developed an appetite for them must actually be pretty significant. Yes. This is just kind of a, an amazing slide. I mean, they're just like hundreds or even thousands of, of the shells. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of shells just kind of gathered up here. Um, what's, what's really going on with the, you know, with the, demise of these guys. I mean, I used to see them all the time, kind of paddling around in the in the uh, turtle grass meadows, but the last time I was uh, out there, I didn't find even one. Yeah, so the really the, the heaviest fishing began in the 1970s when it was, I suppose the ease of shipping in containerized, cool, um, refrigerated freezer type things by ship really really made um, import and export a lot easier for the, for the species to get moved around. And so that's really been what the last 40, 50 years. And so what you're seeing here is a midden and a midden is, um, you, you can see them for other shellfish too. You might see it with oyster middens, the clam mm -hmm. middens, but it tells the history of what's going on. And as they're fish, they're put in these middens. And sometimes you can actually tell like, sort of like the history of the fishing in different parts of the island. It's really incredible. Just, to, just that. Think of each one of those individuals and and just uh, you know heaped up in a stack like that. That's wild. Yeah, it's like it takes four or five years for them to get to the size where that lip forms, and then it can they can go on for decades beyond that. Yeah. I mean, you can get a chicken to market in seven months, and like. The queen conchs, they are vegetable eaters naturally, chickens. Well, I guess they'll eat just about anything. <laughs> Little dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> but but the the conchs, I understand. Um, is it true of all seven species of conchs that they are all herbivores? Yeah, that's that's correct. They're all herbivores, they're all part of the strombid um, group. And so they all have the same um, uh, essentially habitat. Some of them live in a little bit. Siltier, siltier sand, and some of them live in more coarser sand, like the queen. And uh, but they're they're pretty much all grazers. They're all keeping. They're like as you mentioned earlier. They're like underwater cows, keeping the meadows clean. Well, it, it takes it's sunlight to plants with photosynthesis. That's it right. goes to make the animal, but the animals give back nutrients that power the plants. It, right. and, the great grazers across North American plains and in Africa, you know, it's it's a it's a cycle. Yeah. The, the animals eat the plants, but the animals produce the nutrients. They keep them in motion, like the great flocks of birds across North America and elsewhere that once existed, 
kept fertilizing the land as they flew over <laughs> over vast distances, but they're, they're now gone. And we're forced to use these commercial fertilizers that, again, take another big bite out of the system. But, I, you know, it's painful to look at an image like this, but it also makes you wonder, how can we get them back? How can we how can we restore their role in the ecosystems? Because as Liz points out, at least in Florida, they're hard to find. You know, this is part of the reason. It's been used to, to like Just create fill. paving and fill. Yeah, this is this is in Belize, where they, they've been taken in such quantities that. What do you do with a shell once you've taken the animal out? Well, why not build a road? <laughs> or a wall or something. So this is the map you've got here of what's going on with is this kind of current? Um well it looks fairly current and the yeah. fishery closed. Yeah, it's it's it is current. And um you can see that in Florida there has been a moratorium since 1986. And as you were mentioning, it it's uh not as easy to find them when you're snorkeling or diving in the Florida Keys. They're, they're, they are coming back, but it will be a slow process um, for the villagers and the larvae to come in and settle and, and um, make their way back into the seagrass bed. And other areas, you can see there's other areas where there's quotas, um, maybe no scuba diving, uh, size limits. Size limits pretty pretty ubiquitous across the, the regulations. You know that they have to be a size like this one here, they you know they have to be a size and they have, um, total length, and then with the lip as well. So then once they reach a lip size, they don't grow any longer. You know this is as long as that this one will get. So they just start to lip after that. So a lot of the uh, regulations also specify that they have to be collected with a lip, meaning that they will be mature and ready. Mm -hmm. but, able to but breathe. in a way, that's that's perverse because. You want the moms and dads, you want the big old parents to be out there producing the young. We don't take 10-year-old cows or <laughs> five-year-old chickens. You take the young when they're at the fastest growing stage, mm -hmm. when the conversion of sunlight to plants to animal is at the fastest stage. And after that, it levels off and you have to keep feeding groceries, <laughs> but you don't get a whole lot of growth. And in a natural situation like this, part of the reason that restoration in the Florida Keys has been slow is the, the sources, the big old yeah. crops aren't there to yeah, yeah. start the process over again. I mean, well, we and, have, that and, and just the things that have been going into the water, oh, yeah. in addition, oh, you know, it makes too. it really <laughs> tough for them to get reestablished. Yeah. And the seagrass meadows themselves have been, well, they're down to about half of what they used to be in the 1950s and 60s. So it's a double whammy, but cause for hope. And I, I think your message here is you don't have to despair. You can actually do, do something. something. <laughs> exactly. So in your Queen Conch lab, you're you're really actively working to, um, to raise these guys. And I remember, you know, many moons ago out at the at least Stocking Island, there were some efforts to, to in raise Bahamas. in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. We worked to try to get some of the the conch reintroduced, and um, it was it was kind of frustrating because they they all kind of got consumed by you know other critters. <laughs> but yeah, uh, they didn't know how to behave as conchs. Yeah, that's the problem. But Maybe that's tell us tell us about how your lab has been working with these guys to repatriate them. Right, so the the mission of the Queen Conch Lab is to grow the conch for the for the species itself, but also for the ecosystem that we've been talking a lot about. You know, to be able to put them back in the seagrass beds, and then to also work with the island communities and have them learn how to grow conch, um, to restore conch, and also to diversify some incomes um, for for fisheries. Um, and then our vision right now, and we're well on our way for this. Um, is that there to be a community-based Queen Kong farm in every Caribbean nation. And um, right now there are five different nations that we're working with and several others. Um, so I'm, I'm here. 
Yeah, what, go what ahead. Are what are the countries? What, what? So, yeah, so right now I'm actually in Puerto Rico uh, working with our concatchery here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in the southeastern part of uh, Puerto Rico in the Blavo. And I'm also working with the group in Curacao. Nice. And there's two groups in the Bahamas, um, working with the Bahamas National Trust um, in Great Exuma, and then also up in Grand Bahama. And then we're going to be working down in uh, Discovery Bay Marine Lab in uh, Jamaica. Terrific. That's awesome. It, it's just, it, it really is, you know, kind of cause for hope where you, you know, you can get into these areas and give the local communities, you know, a way to, to see a future for, to still have conch in the, you know, in their world. Is it also combined, Megan, with protected areas where they actually mm -hmm. set aside places you don't take the conch and let them be themselves? <laughs> Yes, exactly. So the project that's in Great Exuma um, is associated with the Mariah Harbiki National Park um, that's that's run by the Bahamas National Trust. So the conch will go into that park and so it will be an area for protection for them. Actually, I do recall an occasion that was in Belize, not the Bahamas, where there was or is a protected area. It's across the board, but even the conchs and the lobsters and everything is is fully protected. Like a no takes in. Right. Yeah. And we encountered some some fishermen who had a boatload of conchs. Well, when you're out diving, you usually don't have your wallet with you, but some of us did have a few bucks. And we took, we assembled everything we had and we did a buy and release project. We bought all of the conchs that that fishermen had and then we took them to the protected area and while we were happily taking each one individually and carefully putting it out in a, in, among the natural conchs probably from where it once come anyway you know seagrass meadow no kidding on the horizon a boat came with a red light <laughs> you know, flashing, flashing, flashing. Uh -huh. the patrol guys were really serious about protecting this piece of the reef. And they thought we were taking conch out of the... And fortunately, we had somebody that the authorities knew. Otherwise, we might still be in jail for <laughs> trying to put the conchs back instead of removing them. Anyway, it's hard because protecting something that has got a big price tag on it, uh, it's it's not easy. Yeah. Not easy. I'm so yeah, glad you were in the public. Yeah, there's a great success story in the upper part of the Exumas in the Exuma Land and Sea Park, um, where the conch have been there protected, um, gosh, I want to say like maybe 40 years or so. And anyway, they're a great source of villagers um, that are helping to populate some of the juvenile habitats. Right. So yeah, there there are some great um, great reasons to have these very uh, protected areas where they can be the source of future generations. Could you walk us through this life cycle? It looks really cool. What's yeah, it looks yeah, like a dragonfly. <laughs> so if you look down at the very bottom, the the males and females, it's very difficult to tell who's who when you just look at the shell. Um, so it's not until you see them in their mating position, which is in the photograph on the bottom there, you can see the female is in the front, that's where their eyes come out. And then the male comes up behind and they have to have internal fertilization. So they have to copulate. And that's one of the most important things is that there, there needs to be a certain number of conch in an aggregation in order for it to be successful for a spawning. And so the minimum number is 50 per hectare or 25 per acre. Wow. Um, but that's the very minimum. Um, typically you'd wanna see more like a thousand or maybe 2000 per hectare. Mm. So they'll, they'll mate, they'll mate in the summertime this time of year. And uh, the female will lay an egg mass, which has about a half a million eggs. And, and then she'll lay 10 of those. So she's laying like 5 million eggs wow. every year. Um, which is really phenomenal. And then um, 
after that, the, the eggs incubate in the bottom of the ocean for about four days. And then at nighttime, we know from the laboratory work that they hatch at nine o'clock at night. Huh. And then they hatch in, <laughs> I know, who would have known that? Okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it helps them with their early, their early release then to escape predation in that first, uh, first hatching time. Um, and so these, these villagers hatch out and you can see them in the two lobe and then the four lobe and then the six lobe. And it takes them about two to three weeks and they're drifting in the ocean, they're eating phytoplankton. And then they, then they start doing this very interesting behavior called a swim crawl where they're touching down. Mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, is this where I wanna live? <laughs> and if it's not, <laughs> they'll come back up again mm -hmm. and they'll find the right seagrass bed. And we have found that there are some some differences between seagrass beds that will some will be more preferable for them than others. That's so interesting. Yeah, it is. And and then they settle and they they bury essentially for the first year until they come out at about a year old as what we call them young of the year. And then they they continue to grow um, until they're, you know, for another couple of years until they get their their lip again. That's really cool. A lot of lot of energy goes into making even one conch, and when you see how many there historically have been, just wonder what their now that their numbers are so low, what's been lost to the ecosystem? It just uh, restoring them is, I think, a high priority. Aside from providing the economic benefits for the local people who mm -hmm. eat them and sell them. There is this other really important role, their exactly. ecological role, and the carbon cycle, which is connected to climate. <laughs> well, we know how important, you know, like the the parrotfish are as well, all throughout the Caribbean uh, and around, and even up and around Florida, right. and how the loss of parrotfish has really been detrimental to the to the coral reefs. Mm -hmm. And just like I think the loss of of the conch have been and the lobsters and lobsters have all been sharks all these guys that kind of you know do all these little natural services around the reef to kind of keep mm -hmm. things healthy and the and the seagrass meadows when That's you a, take them out then you know it, it takes a while to to try to there's bring more, balance back. more than one reason why seagrass meadows have been or have declined so quickly because when you start dismembering the system uh, they're more vulnerable to whatever other pressures come along but just look, look, look at those eyes. Look at this face. Oh my gosh. This is a mom, right? Yeah, this is a mom with her egg mask underneath her lip. And um, she's she's laying the egg still. She'll take about 24 to 36 hours till she'll finish laying. And that egg egg mask is one long continuous strand. I think it's like Spaghetti. It's kind of like the, like the length of a basketball court, you know, it's really <laughs> long. <laughs> and it's it's like a monofilament in terms of its size, but it's sticky. So as she's laying at it, it adheres to the sand. And you can see one that's laid in the bottom corner there. That's right. one that she finished laying and it's very camouflaged. It almost um, looks like a sea cucumber, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and so she she essentially walks away or leaps away when she's done after about 24, 36 hours and leaves it on the bottom of the ocean for the, um, you know, for the natural currents to, to, keep it, to keep it well aerated. And then um, what's really cool is that when we bring them in, we only bring a small piece in. We, leave, we bring a small piece in and we leave the rest to hatch naturally. And you can see with the microscope, like the top um, right-hand corner there, you can actually count the number of cells. In that case, like there's like some that are like four cells or eight cells. As they develop. As they develop. And then and then over the course of four days, you can see that middle picture there. You can actually see they look like little villagers all inside their capsule. <laughs> so it is, and they're spinning around and they're like, where's my trap door? I'm ready to get out. <laughs> and that's First out. Yeah. They just like they <laughs> come out and swim out and the, the big, synchronous hatching that happens um, at nine o'clock at night. Wow. Curiously, that's about the same time that it's 9.15 actually, <laughs> <laughs> that 
corals spawn. spawn right. Hey. Yeah, in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere. You, you could, it's like the full moon in August, right? The last four days, few days after the full moon. Yeah. yeah. But it's 9.15 in the evening. Oh, how interesting. All, all heaven breaks loose, you know. Wow. It's just, it's not, you know, not every single one at, at exactly the same time, but, but Close overall, enough. you know, it's <laughs> they're so well synced and, and with other species that release their spawn at the same time sometimes sponges and little brittle right. stars get into the act so do you, is this connected to the moon phase as well or is it mainly just the day no, not really. yeah it's really just time of day because they are laying eggs all the time yeah and these are the little villagers yeah. <laughs> they're so cute like little wings they are like little butterflies, right, in the ocean. Um, yeah, the the ones with the two lobes would be right after hatching. Mm -hmm. And then about four or five days later, they have developed these four lobes, which you can see in the upper part of the photo. Like it was. <laughs> and you can see their shell is also developing more. And the, the, you can see their eyes, right? And um, you can see the foot. The foot is the orange pigment. Right. And then the lobes um, start to divide even more, like at about eight to 10 days, they start to have these six lobes and then they start to elongate their lobes. And, um, you know, I really think that they're elongating because they're getting heavier. Their shell at this point is getting to be almost one millimeter. Right. So they need more surface area to collect the phytoplankton because they're planktotrophic and they need a lot of surface area. And then they need just the, to keep more buoyant in the currents as they're floating around in the sea. Yeah, are, so you, it, are you finding lift. any correlation between their development and ocean acidification? So any, anything with a developing shell is vulnerable as the acidity increases, which is, uh, again, one of the consequences of carbon dioxide excess in the atmosphere that turns to carbonic acid in the ocean and oyster farmers are finding some difficulty with the young getting established because their shells simply dissolve. I mean, <laughs> it's more in cold water that this is being observed, but do you see it in the warm waters of the Caribbean? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't seen it, but we've also, um, colleagues have been studying that um, in the laboratory to see like where the, where that change might happen, but because of because the Caribbean is has a lot of um, carbonates, calcium carbonate really essentially in the water in the warm water. I mean, we are seeing the pH at at you know pretty steady around eight point one, um, but we're keeping an eye on that. That's definitely something that we're concerned about for the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, again, the things that we that we're putting into the ocean, uh, as I often say, you can't treat the ocean like the the supermarket and the sewer at the same time and expect no problems. <laughs> but but it's all this, you know, this particularly around Florida, you know, the immense amount of runoff that uh, from overdevelopment and lawns and agriculture and things like that. But um, but I was thinking about the Bahamas in particular after, you know, the, the brutal hurricane hit that they took and and just how much you know oil and you know, debris and you know all this stuff that just ended up from fields right, and farms and lawns right and but just roots. but but the oil uh, reserve in particular that spilled um mm -hmm. and the impacts that that would have had on some of the the uh, seagrass beds and the near shore reefs it just you all know these delicate creatures kind of water. getting yeah so but you're right um the carbonate base throughout much of the Caribbean helpful uh, is uh, helps offset the acidification that you see elsewhere. Oh, look at the eyes! <laughs> oh my goodness, two eyes! It, it looks like a yeah. nose too. It does. <laughs> They're so adorable. Um, so this is this is right after metamorphosis, and so when they had those long six lobes, like we were talking about in the earlier slide. They have these lobes, but in the upper corner there, you can actually see kind of the lobes are a little wrinkled there. Mm -hmm. And that's 
what the conch's doing is it's touching down to figure out whether or not it's ready for metamorphosis. And so it still has its lobes, but at the same time, it can use its foot to have it as a sensory to say whether or not. So they'll like touch down, come back up and swim again. And then we know as aquaculturists um, growing these, we can say, ah, they're ready, you know, let, let's give them the cue. And then about anywhere from five hours to 24 hours after they've been given their cue, which is actually um, seagrass blades, but it's a detrital seagrass blade. So the, the brown blades that come off the seagrass have all of these beautiful epiphytes and diatoms. And that's what we give them because we know that that's, that's what they're looking for. They want to settle where they can find their food. And they'll lose, they'll lose those lobes or sometimes they absorb them. Next thing you know, they're crawling around and they're grazing with their proboscis. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's very gratifying. I'm sure to see them like, you know, tuck into their, their diatoms and such. Absolutely. And then here, oh, look at these little guys. Yeah. So the ones in the, in the hand on the left-hand side, the little ones, those are ones that we've grown. Those are a couple months old and we grow them on sand. So you can see the sand in the background and then you can actually see some of the detrital blades. And so we put those in there too, just to help them feel more at home. And, um, and then in the other photos, it shows like a series down the bottom there with the ruler from about one month old all the way up to probably like about six to eight months old. They grow pretty quickly. All yeah, considerably. considerably, considering how much shell they have to put on, right. I really think so. Yeah. And, yeah. The ones in the, in the upper part of the photograph are one-year-olds that we found in the Bahamas. It was like this big nursery. I was so excited to be swimming around and just seeing like little one-year-olds everywhere. This was in East End, Grand Bahama. And there's so many beautiful nurseries there with the conch. And so we just had to take a quick photo and um, to show them, how, you know, how beautiful they are. And you can see they've sort of emerged recently because they ha kind of have a lot of silt um, and sand on their shell, actually a little bit of a chakra. So they're very well camouflaged. Yeah, beautiful though. Yeah. Who in, what in nature consumes conchs? Uh, yes. <laughs> So they have a lot of a lot of predators. They're a really important part of the food web. Um, they get eaten by by turtles and, I and rays. Loggerheads in particular, right? Yeah, exactly. They're big open jaws. Yep. yep, they really know how to crush them. And then also the the rays um, consume. They, they go after the little ones, though, right? Not. Yeah, kind of more like the size, like the one year olds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, there's the uh, lobsters, and also would they go for a big one? Would a lobster go challenge? No, they're gonna eat more of the size that we're seeing in these photos. Um, they have a hard time with their mandibles being able to break the shell. Much mm -hmm. more than that, what they'll do is they actually take the tip of the shell and they sort of take it in their mandible and they like break it. And that helps them to get started. And then, and then sometimes they can crush the rest of their, if you see like a spiral shell on the beach, it's mm -hmm. pretty yeah. cool that it's been from a lobster or a crab that's eaten. Uh, I can imagine a stone crab with their big claw <laughs> going crunch. Yeah, yeah. What, about, what about octopus? Oh my gosh, the octopus. And the octopus are like pretty much eat them at any stage, even when they're adults. I can remember wow one inside of an adult um, eating away at it and once it left then the murex came in the apple the apple murex came in and they started cleaning up from behind because they're oh. carnivorous of course um yeah and i think there there is reports that possibly sharks eat them but i haven't really seen any exact um reference to that or any photographs but i'm still still think that they could potentially be a, a predator but the, no predator as comprehensive or as effective as humans. And you know, we take them by the ton and the others just as needed for lunch. <laughs> and they give back. We don't give back. We take yeah. and 
don't keep putting the right things back in to keep the system going. We put the wrong things back in. Anyway, oh, look at this series. It's really yeah, interesting it's, to see how they form those those big kind of spines, and then as they get they get worn down, get kind of worn down, I guess. Yeah, look at that. Look at that oldie up in the corner there. Um, yeah. that, that's going to be one that's been around for 30, 40 years. It's um, really they're much thicker. Much, much thicker. And in the Bahamas, and I think in the Turks and Caicos, they call them the Samba, Samba conch. Mm -hmm. And um, some, some feel like it's a different species, but really it is the same. It's just that it looks so different as it gets older. It's the ancient mariner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's good that you brought up the spines because that, that really is a mechanism for defense. Um, you know, the more, the more protrusion there are on those spines, the harder it is for some, some animals like the rays and turtles and things like that to really like get around it. You know, yeah. so it, it does start to afford it some good protection. Do they, do they go dead? Do they always just stay on the sand or do they sometimes try to get like in a crevice or something to avoid a predator? Um, they're pretty much in the sand. Um, you know, they can bury, but they couldn't bury fast enough to get away yeah. from the predator. Yeah. Hmm. But do they keep reproducing as long as they live, basically? They do. They do, which is really wonderful to know that they're still giving offspring into their older age. That's very cool. Keeping the older ones would seem to be beneficial that, you know, you've got yeah. to have the moms and dads if you're going to have kids. Exactly. And then, so this is, this map shows the, the current uh, farms and then you're, you've got the, the projections for where you want to see them come along next, huh? So the black yeah. spots are where, where you've got something going right now? Yes, exactly. So you can see where we're located up in Florida, um, in Fort Pierce, um, mm. and then the two projects in the Bahamas, and then the project here in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and then on down to Curacao, um, over to Jamaica. And then we've been having some wonderful discussions with other groups, other uh, nonprofit community groups in each of the other islands. The uh, Organization for Eastern Caribbean States is really interested in having punk farms down in St. Vincent, Grenadines, Grenada, St. Lucia, um, Belize as well. So, yeah, it's very exciting to have these dialogues and to talk with people and, um, and to see how we can help to um, get them started and having a punk farm there as well. Nothing in Cuba yet. No, I'd love to go to Cuba. It would be amazing. We have some fantastic seagrass meadows. Yes, yes, great, it would be. Great home territory definitely. for them. You have to see if there's Queen Conch in the Queen's Garden. Is that yeah, it? Garden yeah. of the Queen. That's right. <laughs> so exactly. of Cuba. Yeah, amazing opportunities. Bravo. Do you, are there any kind of natural overlaps with any of your existing uh, hope spots that you know from the map? Look here. Um, yes. And we should do more. <laughs> so. We should do, we should talk about this because we're getting the community engagement as you are doing to the combination of things to protect what remains that's in good shape and restore what is possible. And this looks like a great way to have your conks and eat them too, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> but it'd be really interesting to kind of overlay your you know your mission blue hope yeah. spot map here and there could be some real natural yeah synergies between uh, as things that you know people can do locally they can get involved with one of the the conch farms and especially where there are gaps we can help work together to fill them yeah that'd, that'd be amazing i've been following your work with um with the hope spot incredible so I bet you making ways. There's going to be a lot of ni nice overlap there. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. And the Virgin Islands, that's where the you had the, the tectite habitat, right? That's right. Yeah. So it'd be some, I know they had a lot of destruction of the uh, corals, especially the, like the staghorn, mm -hmm. elk, elkhorn corals and things there. But um, it'd be another really good place to target for mm -hmm. 
Okay. And there's a lot of community being support. targeted. Look, well, I know big... she's got a dot on it. She's got a whole sign on it. It's in the crosshairs. Yeah, that's great. That's awesomeness. So let's talk about some of the the community effort um, and how, how you're working with the people that um, have depended on conch in one way or another for their livelihoods. But now, yeah. they're, gone. But now they're gone, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. This, the, these photos are actually taking place in Puerto Rico. Um, and you can see here that we have a number of, of, of different fishermen that are involved in working with us. And this project that we have in Puerto Rico is with a local organization called Conservation Conciencia and also with the Naguabo Fishing Association. And so we've come together in this partnership and they've provided us a space um, within the actual fishing community and in the fishing association, which is a co-op here. And so the fishermen help us to identify where the nurseries are so that we can work with them to do restoration. They also help us to find the, the small um, pieces of egg masses that we need. And for that work, we uh, acknowledge that and we provide funding for the fishermen to have diversified income to come and work with us. And we also have local, um, local staff and local students and interns and um, also uh, the contractors help me with the plumbing or help us with the plumbing. <laughs> Um, help us moving tanks around. And so it, it really is a community effort. And that was, um, that was the way it was from the very beginning. Um, and so it's, it's something that um, I, I think it's really the only way to do this type of work is with the so, community. So one thing, there's no way without having the lab set up that you can provide that they would know what it takes to make a conch right. from scratch. <laughs> starting with the little villagers or the eggs and then the villagers and to understand that must convey a, a greater sense of respect when yeah. you just see the finished product out there like a grown-up conch um you just take would be more inclined to take them for granted but when you realize what a miracle it is because there's so many mouths along the way that want to eat the little babies <laughs> And a, yeah. a few of them get through and become grown-ups themselves. It's uh, when it really puts in perspective what inroads we have had, as you point out, mostly since the 70s, the greatest time of exploitation and reducing the, the population, the adult population. So it's no wonder that the, they're, they're just the numbers have crashed. Well, it gives them really, uh, you know, more skilled science uh, oriented jobs for uh, people in the community as well right. to really be working with these animals from you know, like the egg stage, the larval stage. Right. And and really kind of, you know, encouraging those kind of science careers. I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I bet you get the kids involved, too, don't you? We do. We do. We it's in some ways it's a family. Um, affair, you know, like we're all there together. And so one of our staff is the wife of the fisherman and she brings her children in and they help in the hatchery as well. So it's, it's really great. We, re we strongly encourage that, that type of activity and involvement. That's, that's really good because, you know, so many times you'll see kids that they'll, you know, they're curious in this kind of stuff, but then they get their kind of curiosity is kind of beaten out of them, you know, <laughs> and they, uh, they end up just you know, not going into the water or not, not doing things that are um, really engaging. So if you can get them uh, wet, no, yeah. no child left dry, right? Yeah. <laughs> get them wet and, and out there and really taking some, some stewardship of these guys. And that's amazing. So I see you've got the conks tagged. Do you ever name them? I mean, Jane Goodall names her chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, yeah, it's funny you say that because we have a couple named um conch in our hatchery here in Puerto Rico. One of them grew so quick that the staff named that one Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> so we have that one there. And, you know, so once in a while, we have another one called Juan Sebastian. Um, so, you know, and so we, we, you know, we don't name them all for sure, but the this, this particular study was in uh, Great Exuma in the Mariah Harvey Key National Park that's that's run by Bahamas National Trust. And this was a replenishment study. This was when we 
bought, we actually bought the conch. When you told me that story earlier about you buying the conch from the fisherman, we actually bought the conch from the fisherman in this case too. And we put them in a very, very large pen. I think the diameter was something like a hundred feet diameter, very wow. large. And we put 200 conch in there. And this was um, part of the study of one of our graduate students. And we tagged them all so that we could watch their movement and watch their grazing behavior and, and see if they would uh, lay eggs. And, and so it was really became a great uh, study to watch. And you can actually see some very interesting things in this particular photo. You can see that the area where the conch are, the seagrass is actually a little bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. And that in the outside of the pen, there's a little bit more epiphytes on there. Mm -hmm. And I think I think maybe possibly in the next slide, you'll see it even more so. There you go. Yeah. So, um, so you can see where the conch are. They've been doing a really great job of, of cleaning the seagrass blades of the epiphytes. Whereas you can see that there's a lot more fuzzy epiphytes on the other side. Nice. Well, that means they're they're not entirely herbivores because when they start... Yeah, right. So you get the like bryozoans and yeah, bryozoans. You get some hydroids. You get a little meat next to your vegetables. <laughs> there you go. More, more omnivorous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. And yeah, go back. Well, I was just just thinking that going back to our discussion about carbon and carbon sequestration and how important mm -hmm. this grass beds are so the more photosynthesis can take place the cleaner the blades are right, that's right that can actually so the comp can actually help with carbon sequestration within the seagrass beds as well and i said that's increase the photosynthetic exactly area. yeah yeah exactly the cleanup crew yeah but, but they also yeah. put the nutrients back that power exactly exactly yeah. So this is actually the project that we've been talking a little bit about during our conversation, um, the one in Naguaba where I am right now, and the partners um, that we have involved, and then also our funding sources. And so it's it's a project that's been going on now for three years. Um, and it's also been a model hatchery for others to come and train with us and for others to also look and see what else they can do in their community. And so it's it's nice to be able to highlight and to be able to you know talk about this project because of its um, because of its great reach and what we've been yeah. able to do not only locally but also Caribbean wide. Here's the fisherman with some of the egg oh, masses and things. Bringing in the <laughs> egg and, and yeah. helping us. Um, we we minimally process it, but we just kind of break it apart, just very very gently. Um, not really breaking apart, but just removing some of the sand so that when we put it in the, the incubator that the flow of water can really help to develop the eggs. Excellent. <laughs> These big muscular fishermen with their little bag of eggs, it's yeah. great. <laughs> I know, and it's so wonderful. They just love the involvement with us and they're always so excited to tell us where they were and where you know what depth they were and how they found them and they take videos and photos it's it's a really remarkable um uh, collaboration great i love it yeah and so this is our hatchery in puerto rico um the egg incubator is on the right hand side you can see all the eggs um uh, incubating there and, and then the hatchery the larval tanks and also the algae area because we have to grow the food for them so essentially we're um, mimicking the ocean inside the laboratory for them. Excellent. And then this is our nursery area where we feed them some uh, seaweed based uh, feed that we make. And then you can see the little juveniles on the sand. We measure them every two weeks just to see how they're growing, to check their health. And there's a cute little one where there's the eyes out. To oh yeah. It's like it, it's look, it looks like it's contemplating a piece of a uh, uh, turtle grass there. Exactly. Yeah. Just saying, are you my mom? Are you my mom? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, this is this is moving on talking about restoration. You know, how, all the things that we need to take into consideration to be able to put these conch back out in the field. Do you check to see how many survive once you've put them in the ocean? 
Uh, yeah, if, um, if you could go back for just a second, Liz. Um, we do, so in some cases we can tag them again, or we can just put them out into a certain number per area and come back on a either daily or weekly basis mm -hmm. and look to see how, how well they're surviving. And mm -hmm. so those are, those are some of the things that we do take into consideration when we're planting. And one of the most important things is to actually, uh, actually receive them in nursery areas where there's already conch. Yeah. And the reason for that is, right, because they, they, it's like a safety in numbers. Yeah. Um, and that way you're not bringing in a whole new suite of predators. Right. And, uh, right? So because the, if you just have one big void area, that can be uh, quite a problem for their first initial survival. Yeah. So Sitting point. ducks. <laughs> right. Sitting conks. Yeah. No, that makes, that really makes sense. Also, you know that the habitat is suitable because you've already got other conch. Exactly. Exactly. And the conch on the run here. <laughs> well, yeah. So, okay. So you, you saw the map and you saw how many places we want to go. Um, so we've been working on developing a mobile lab that we can build at Harbor Branch um, with our with our machinists and fabricators and engineers and be able to build them and put them on a ship and send them down to the islands. And then from there, I go down and I train on how to do the, the growing. So the first mobile lab in the world for conch is located in Rolltown Exuma um, in the Mariah Harbor Key National Park with, the, with Bahamas National Trust taking the lead on this. And we developed, the, we co-developed this first one together and it's working so, Great that we, we had the first hatch actually just like three or four nights ago. Nice. And so, and we're using natural seawater to bring in the food for them. And so we're trying to mimic as much as possible what nature has to provide. Instead of the investment that you have to make to grow in these big containers, the food, which oh, is not as complete, or will never be as complete as what you get in a natural. I um, all that diversity. And and that was the basis of my dissertation is looking at conch growing and natural on natural feeds. So we're putting it to practice now in the hatchery. And, and then we're going to take the small conch actually when they're much smaller um, than, than one year, maybe like just a couple months old so we can keep them more naive and, and put them in the, in the water there. And so I'm working very closely with my colleague, uh, Catherine Booker there. Um, on that project. Excellent. And you have the, the aquaculture manual in uh, bilingual form, which is super important. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're hoping to have French at some point. That would be great as well. All right. So we're going to, we're a little short on time, but we're going to jump into the Q&A. <laughs> oh, look at this. Great. Yeah, I've got a, any that we don't, don't get to, we'll answer offline. Um, let's see here. Brenna says, I see on the geographic range that much of the Caribbean is covered, but the Barbados is not included. Why have they not gone this far east? Is there some ecosystem factor or have they gone extinct here? Uh, so for Barbados, we would be very happy to work with anybody that would like to have a hatchery there. You to volunteer there. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Jenny is asking, how well do you conch see their eyes certainly look quite expressive ah uh, yeah so they actually have very complex um eyes and they can see quite well they see in the same way that a mammal sees a vertebrate eye Ooh, that's a good question i don't know i'm not sure about that but they do react they to do react almost vertebrate. immediately yeah yeah It'd be what? interesting to know what they actually like what they can see exactly or if they actually recognize you yeah right oh, there's <laughs> Mom. <Right>, actually <laughs> be surprised. They, know, they know when the staff are coming to feed yeah oh, i can imagine yeah. yeah um april says it seems like a lot of resorts in the caribbean have conch on the menu is yeah. it possible to get regulations to get them off the menu or to, to in order to help restore the population or to make yeah. sure that they're cultivated conch. Yes, right. So that so that's a great question, and and each country has a set of regulations that they work with. 
And so it's really a matter of the country um, making those decisions. For instance, the Bahamas just closed export for conch. So that's a really good thing um, as a way to help as well. So, so each country will have um, some different regulations to work with. It's, the more people know and understand and appreciate the conch, the less likely you are to enjoy conch fritters or conch chowder or whatever. It's, yeah, you know, it's just you know, it's, to take these miracles and think of them only as Meat. as something to eat is yeah. a, a little, <laughs> doesn't speak very well of humans. But <laughs> on the other hand, if you can, one of the problems with the, the Cayman Islands turtle farms was it's hard to tell whether a turtle that went to market was was cultivated or whether it came from nature. And it's one of the reasons that I, I suppose you have to certify if you're going to have a, a aquaculture conch to know that that they have been actually grown, not taken out of the wild. Yeah. Blockchain but, conch. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Traceability. Yeah. But Anyway, it's out there to be done. One of the challenges, one of the many challenges. Many challenges. Yeah. Um, let's see, Brenna is asking, are there any citizen science opportunities for conquest restoration? Or citizen science citizen opportunities. Science. I think you're doing it. Yeah, so I mean, we do. We have the local community working with us. So in each island, I think there's, um, each island that we have the farms, there's definitely a lot of work that can be done with uh, citizen science. So welcome that. Um, yeah, if we develop the alliance with the Hope Spot program, we can enhance uh, it even further. Oh, yeah, that'd be we will. It, it's just, I think, you know, there, there really is that opportunity there. We've seen it. We've seen so many people, you know, kind of come out and help with the uh, horseshoe crab efforts. Yeah. And, and again, it just takes people kind of recognizing these animals as really cool, alive, yeah. and really, and just, you know, especially just thinking that. Hey, that conch recognizes you in the lab <laughs> and <laughs> kind of comes over where's my seagrass you know <laughs> making it cool to care making it cool to care uh jenny is asking do we know which criteria play a role in young conch choosing their right seagrass bed to settle in mm -hmm. they actively oops i lost my question they actively consciously choose uh that's such a great question because uh, the studies that we did at lee stocking island um with Alan Stoner's group, we looked at um, plankton toes and tried to see where the where the villagers were. And what we were finding is that there's certain areas where the currents are going that the conch really like to to go to, which makes a lot of sense because then it's also bringing in new food for them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a matter of the of the currents bringing in the type of epiphytes, and that's why some seagrass beds have different assemblages of epiphytes and the others. And it, it's such a fascinating topic um, to, to think through. And Stephanie is asking, how do you put a tag on a conch? <laughs> <laughs> Super glue. Very carefully. Very carefully. <laughs> they, have to, they have to have the spines. Um, and then we use a, a Monel stainless steel wire and that can shape around it. And then we put a little tag that has a number on it from there. Yeah, so you don't like drill or shell or anything like that. That's good. And finally, George uh, says, I can assure you Cozumel census for conch was way down and they just keep extracting and I keep trying to get them to end selling the shells and I'll get this web chat to influencers at the MPA and pray. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's the other market for, for the just, shell. Yeah. just as ornaments. I've seen all the way too many conch shell lamps, for example. It's yeah. <laughs> you know with a clock right in the middle it's just crazy stuff <laughs> it is really sad when you see things like that yeah. but i'm just so grateful for your efforts to restore these guys and and uh, and really bring them back in force they're just they're such iconic animals for the whole region and seeing them out there alive is reason for everyone to put on so, a mask and snorkel and dive in with them because they're just so great to find out in the wild yeah Thank you for diving in with us. And, and before we close today, um, we'd like to say thank you, Megan. Thank you so much. And to our producer, the Ocean Elders, and mostly to the entire diving community. You keep coming back and um, getting salty with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and water connects us all. So we're so grateful. 
We are going to be back on May 25th. We'll be talking with Kirsten Horsberg about manta rays in the Peruvian oh, seascape. That's going to be another really cool program. So until then, remember, take care of the ocean. As if, it just as if your life depends on it. Because it does. It does. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye for now.